Hey everybody, welcome to All Team Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we're going to be looking at part two of one of our recent videos that we put out on creating schematic symbols for large pin count components like BGAs. So in that previous video, we looked at how to group different types of pins into different subparts within that schematic symbol. So these large pin count components can have multiple symbols that make up the entire component. And it's important to, if you are creating one of those schematic symbols, to group the pins together in a certain way to make it very easy to design with. Now, that particular video was spawned by a viewer question, and there's a second part to that viewer question which relates to FPGA development. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compare what happens with an FPGA versus what happens with something like an MPU. Follow along in LTV designer and let's get started. So in this question, Mylon is asking about how many gates or blocks you are going to divide the overall symbol into and then can you show an FPBGA or FPGA used in a schematic and then brought into a PCB design? So there's something important to note here because when you look at different schematic symbols that have high pin count, what you'll actually see is for different types of components, the pins are gonna be grouped in different ways. Now, if you're just downloading the symbol, you can change it yourself if you want, but most people will just kind of go with the symbol as it is provided to them. For something like an MPU, it actually makes a lot more sense to just leave it as is because if the symbol was created properly, the pins on different interfaces are gonna be grouped together in a specific way. So let me show you what I mean. So for an MPU, microprocessor unit, you may see something kind of like this where you have different groups of symbols that are assigned to groups of pins. So this could be like your ground symbol and it won't always be literally named ground, but the idea here is that all of these pins will be ground pins and you just kind of connect them all together to the same net like this. And we saw the same kind of thing with like a power symbol. So the previous example that we used was like a 2v5 uh, power rail. So here, all of these pins, for example, would all just connect up to, let's say, 2v5. Now with an MPU, what you're gonna have is you'll have some other symbols that will then have different interfaces uh, broken out into the symbol. So just as an example, this might be uh, SPI, uh, this might be a bank of GPIOs. This is with an MPU, okay? So a microprocessor unit. You'll see the same type of thing done in an MCU or a microcontroller unit. Now, what about with an FPGA? Well, with an FPGA, this isn't actually done. So with an FPGA, what you will generally see is you will see banks of pins like this, but these banks of pins will just have some kind of general name. Maybe it's gonna be like bank one, pin zero, let's say. Bank one, pin one. I'm just kind of making up names here, but you kind of get the idea here is that it's gonna break out this list of pins into the same symbol. And so the idea here is that they're co-located somewhere in the FPGA, or they could be allocated to similar interfaces. And you don't really know, or you don't always know, just by looking at the schematic symbol. You may have to actually look into a data sheet to see what these different groups of pins on a single symbol are meant to do. So it's important to note that on an FPGA, you are not actually wiring up to specific interfaces broken out by pin name. You actually have the freedom to instantiate different interfaces in the FPGA based on where you want those connections to be in the PCB layout. Just as an example, when I'm developing the FPGA, I could make these three pins, let's say, part of a DDR bus. And then I could make these three pins part of a DDR bus. But I could then, if I wanted to, have these three pins be an SPI bus and so on and so forth. So I have the freedom to develop that within some limits, but I do have the freedom to develop that inside of the FPGA interconnect fabric. And so by doing that, I have the freedom to select where inside of the footprint I actually want all of these different interfaces to go. What is the most efficient way to actually arrange this inside of a PCB footprint when you actually put the component into the PCB layout? Well, that's a bit more difficult because you have to know where you're gonna be routing ahead of time. And as you assign pins to these different groups, it's not always so obvious where you're going to be routing. So because of that, there is a feature that most PCB design software will implement called 
pin swapping. Pin swapping is a feature that you're gonna activate inside of the PCB layout. And what it's gonna do is it's going to allow you, as you're actually routing, to swap, say, this SPI bus, which would have been here, for the pins on what might be a different symbol, let's say these three pins. And instead of having it here, you can immediately swap it and put it over here. So what you have to do is configure different groups of pins to be enabled for pin swapping in order to actually do this. But as you're actually going through and routing in the PCB, you're gonna be able to grab these groups of pins and select exactly where they go with the pin swapping tool. And it's automatically going to update those assignments inside of the schematic. So how do you know which groups of pins to enable for pin swapping? And how do you know that you can swap, say the SPI bus right here over to here? What tells you that you're allowed to do that? Well, you're gonna be limited by what you can do in the FPGA based on the information that's in the data sheets because not all of these pins are gonna support every kind of interface. So I drew DDR right here, but maybe this group of pins only supports, let's say, uh, LVDS. So maybe it only supports differential pairs LVDS. In that case, I couldn't group this into the same bucket as DDR and then maybe make this kind of swap like this as I'm doing the PCB layout. So just be mindful of that when you're actually making these initial pin assignments to different nets, as well as how you group these different sets of pins so that you can enable pin swapping between these groups. So what's the next thing that you notice about these different groups of pins that you can swap? The next thing you should notice about what I've written between here and here is that this is a differential interface. So LVDS is differential pairs, okay? And that's actually what the D in LVDS stands for. It stands for differential. Here with DDR, DDR uses differential clock, but it also has single-ended signals in it. So a DDR bus does not always just swap directly with an LVDS set of signals. So because of that, you may also be limited in terms of what pins you can swap based on whether or not they're single-ended or differential. So in a lot of FPGAs, when you're setting up your IOs and you're setting up the interconnect fabric and the developer tools, what you can usually do is assign a single-ended bus like SPI to a group of pins that are ostensibly named positive and negative, let's say. However, you can't necessarily do the opposite. So if there are certain pin groups that are only meant for single-ended signals, you can't then swap a differential protocol onto those signals, that protocol is not going to work. So data sheets will tell you all of this if you look deep enough. The problem is that those data sheets on FPGAs can be hundreds of pages long, and that's just for the general information on the component. Then once you get to the IO specifications, you have another set of data sheets that could also be hundreds of pages long. So that's a lot of information to look through. By far the fastest way to get that information directly is to actually go into the developer tool and just start setting up the IOs because the developer tool will actually limit what interfaces you can assign to different pins. So if you start in the developer tool, you'll be able to build out a list of different pins that's gonna support these different interfaces. And then you can use that to configure pin swapping. Okay, everybody, so all of this inside the PCB layout is enabled by a feature called pin swapping. And Altium Designer does have a pin swapping tool built into it. Other PCB design software applications also have their own pin swap tools built into them. In the description, there will be a link to a feature demo video that actually shows you what pin swapping is and what it looks like as you're working in the PCB layout. We're also gonna film a demo video that shows you really in depth how to set this up and how to use it inside of a PCB layout to help you expedite routing, as well as make all these swaps that we've been talking about between different schematic symbols. And as you'll see in that video, it's gonna help you save a lot of time because you don't have to go back into the schematic editor and manually move around these net assignments between different symbols. All right, everybody, thanks for watching this video and sticking around. Make sure to hit that like button, hit the subscribe button to keep up to date with all of our upcoming videos and of course the Altium on Track podcast. And last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, everybody. Yeah.